we are recording. So hello and welcome to episode two of Meet the Maesters of Defense. This is an opportunity for people to present us with questions and for us to give our honest feedback uh, about our thoughts, our journey to the mastery of defense, and how to support the current and future generations of women and gender minority in fencing. Uh, a bit of housekeeping first, if you aren't one of the maesters who wants to participate on this panel, uh, we'll ask you to mute yourself and turn off the camera. We welcome and encourage everyone to be here and to put questions in the chat. Uh, I will be monitoring that. Uh, and uh, But the maesters are the ones who are going to be chatting. Uh, maesters, if you'd like to pitch in but don't want to show your video, that's okay too. I am Brigid. I will be today's moderator and calling on the maesters one at a time to answer questions. Uh, and uh, if you have a question, please again put it in the comments. And with that, let's introduce the ladies of the Master of Defense, starting with Lizabetta. Give us a little Hi. info about you. <laughs> sure. I, Master Lizabetta, I am a mod of the Mid Realm, and I was made, let's see here, 2018? Yeah, 2018. So it's been two years. And I, um, I'm also the Baroness of my local barony, Sternfeld in Indianapolis. Awesome. awesome. Oh, and I have a five-year-old. You have a five-year-old, and you were also Kingdom Rapier Marshal. And I was Kingdom Rapier Marshal, yes. I was Kingdom Rapier Marshal while I was pregnant. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's, that's beast mode. Okay. Uh, Ernie. Hello, oh, I'm Ernie. I have been fencing for a very long time. Long enough that I have to pull out a calculator to try and figure out how long it's been, and I didn't get it done before it got to be my turn. <laughs> um, I was one of the first to start up fencing in Eldemir. I've been KRM twice and SRM once, and I have two children who are now 16 and 17. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Illidor. Hi, I'm Master Illidor de Bedegrain. I was the, one of the premier masters of defense of the West, and I now am living in Athelmark, sort of. I live in Atlantia, technically, but I'm Kingdom Seneschal for Athelmark. I have been fencing for 19 years. That's an easy number for me to do, just minus one. And um, I have a cat. As you've seen, I also have a cat who's going to be all over me, apparently. That's okay. <laughs> all right, Rosa. Hi, I'm Mr. Rosa out in Ontario. Um, I'm actually second generation. I've been fighting 25 years now. <laughs> um, started in Drakenwald, moved to the middle where I got my scarf. Um, and yeah, that's me. Brigitte was my old mod and helped me get elevated. Yay. All right, Nicolina. Hi, I'm Nicolina Depar from Artemisia. Um, I've been playing in the SCA for about 16 years, fencing for 13 of them, and I was elevated on March 7th. So pretty new to this whole mod thing. You are, you are one of the coronavirus mods. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, sorry. Uh, anyway, happy to have you here. I am Dame Brigid. I am a Master of Defense in Antir, uh, previously of the Middle Kingdom and the East Kingdom, and I will be the moderator today. I think I said that before. Uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous first time doing this. Uh, so today, uh, I, I got a bunch of questions in downtime. Thank you, everyone who submitted questions. Um, we have enough uh, questions to do uh, this episode and another, uh, so I broke it up. Um, I moved all of the training questions uh, to the next episode uh, because we have uh, some really good stuff about supporting uh, family and community and mentorship uh, that, that we'd like to get to. Uh, so <clears throat> first off, uh, opening with an, with an easy kind of generic -y question, uh, it's more about the path of peerage. Uh, what was the hardest part of your path before being put on vigil and the hardest part after being put on vigil? Who wants to go first? Sure, uh, I can go first. Uh, All right, Lizabetta. 
All right. So the hardest part before being put on digital was building a confidence in myself that I felt that I was worth the honor. And um, in order to develop that confidence, sometimes it took external validation. So I had uh, my husband on the sidelines watching and counting, okay, this person is saying that they're beating you, but they're really not. You're doing awesome. Um, sometimes it was tournament wins that's helpful so again external validation but ultimately it came down to um, being confident in myself that I was part of this community and making a difference and um, <laughs> feeling that I was worth uh, being here and then uh, the hardest part of my path afterwards has been uh, conflicting obligations so I am a mom I am a baroness and feeling like I and putting enough time into um, being a good representative of the uh, Masters of Defense because there are so few women at this point in time. I want to be visible and feeling like I have a challenge and not being as visible as I'd like. It, it is a bit of an extra stressor uh, being, being one of the, the few women, you know, in, in a kingdom when there aren't a lot of women. So, uh, who's next? Illidor, did I see your hand? Oh, I was making the just a little bit sign, but oh, just uh, a little bit sign. <laughs> so I had like, uh, like the mod was, I, there was, I don't, I can't really talk about becoming a, like, what was the, before I became mod, because I was one of the first ones, I was made on the first day. So it was sort of like getting my clothes ready, where it's really my biggest like challenge <laughs> at that time. From the time it was announced, 30 days prior, then it was like, there's no collars, there's no regalia, there's no nothing, go make stuff in 30 days. So that was pretty much um, my big one. But um, going back to being a white scarf, when I became white, th that, that memory is really stuck with me in that I was so worried before, before getting there, I, I did not want to be a white scarf because I knew it was a job. I knew that this was this was this was nice. I was going to get a scarf and be recognized, but I also deeply understood that being uh, a white scarf was a job, and I was not I did not have the confidence to believe that I could do it. Other people said sure I could, but I did not have that personal confidence. I thought that I would do a good job at it, and that segues perfectly into the hardest part about for me afterwards is. Um, the expectations, right? The expectation, I don't want to fail, I don't want to fail in the eyes of others. I, uh, there's high expectations for what a mod is and what a maester of defense is. And I want to make sure that I'm doing my utmost best to meet those. And that's a lot of pressure that uh, I and others put on myself. And so that's really, I would say the hardest, the hardest part since the path is trying to live up to other people's expectations. Anyone else? Sure. Um, my hardest part was moving right when the mod was created. Um, so that that was the hardest part was reestablishing myself, reestablishing my prowess and everything, and um, just showing that I was part of Ontier, that it was my home now. Um, I did a lot of extra things, like they have a uh, sergeant trials out here that kind of shows, it, it's a very unique thing they used to do when they were part of the West Kingdom that it's a very intensive, like all day testing where you have to dance and and do some crafts and other things. So that, that was a lot of fun, but it was also trying to say that, hey, I'm here, I'm on tier, I want to be here, I want to be your family. Um, so that was the hardest part. After the world right now, I'm sure is everybody's answer. Um, but it's also on the baronial senescial right now. So making sure I'm doing my duties there while I'm trying to do other duties at when I have mod meetings at things and trying to be a teacher for my cadets or students or anyone I have. Um, but yeah, overall, right now, it's because I've only had it for a year now. It's been, I've been doing a lot on the field, but right now it's just kind of like everything's on hold. So 
trying to do a lot more with the Zoom videos so I can contribute and still teach has been really helpful. Your near Nicolina? Sure. Uh, I interpreted your question as the hardest part before the vigil going all the way back to the beginning. Uh, so for me, yes. the hardest <laughs> yeah, the hardest part was finding teachers. Uh, when Eldemir first started fencing, we were the first ones fencing and I was one of the leaders, one of the teachers, and I had to go a long way to find a teacher for me. Uh, after the vigil, I don't, nothing particularly seems hard after having actually been elevated. Um, nothing seem, it doesn't seem all that different from before the elevation to afterwards for me. Nicolina? Yeah, so for me, um, I guess when I came back after college, um, I've noticed that newcomers or people starting up again, we tend to come in waves or in groups. Um, and so I was kind of one of the first of my generation. And then there was a big gap between me and the next newest of the fencers. And so going from having uh, Hego, who was kind of the most junior of the previous wave, get his mod and then going, oh shoot, you know, my wave is next and, re and going, you know, I, I might actually be good enough for this and stepping up was, it was the hardest part and getting, I think a whole lot of people thought I was ready before I was even ready to think about it. And after, since I was elevated on March 7th, has been COVID. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, for, for me, my hardest, my hardest part uh, was, uh, was, you know, when I was a cadet, you know, that was a long time ago. Uh, but, but the hardest part after being put on vigil, I was put on vigil at Barron's Ball, which is probably one of my favorite small, like little intimate events out here. And that was in October, and I was training for Queen's Rapier Championship, which is a huge deal in Ontario. On and that was in January. And so uh, my elevation was supposed to be at that same event, which is, is Twelfth Night and Queen's Rapier Championship. And uh, so that weekend I was put on vigil, and then during the week, only a few days after I was put on vigil, I was at practice, training, pushing myself hard to, to fight at QRC, and I tore a ligament. And uh, that tear just caused me to, of course, realize, oh shit, I need to not fight for a while and let this, this, let this heal. I didn't realize it was torn. And I got to the event where I was elevated and it meant so much to me. Like I felt so much pressure to go out and fight. And I fought two bouts and I was so much in so much pain because of the ligament tear. I realized I was actually genuinely injured. And then I spent the next year in, in recovery with physical therapy. And so the hardest part after my vigil was just that I couldn't fight for like a year and a half. And my, I could have fought offhand, but that ligament was also kind of giving me, I'm not happy either. So uh, I just felt like I failed everyone by not, by not fighting for a year and a half and was super self-conscious about it to the point that I actually cried when I went back to fighting and my husband had to actually convince me to leave the tent <laughs> and go fight. I was going to hide because uh, I was so terrified to go out and fight because um, I was now a mod and obviously I should fight well and I just didn't feel like I would be ready. And of course I was ready. I fought just fine. Everything was good. Like, you know, <laughs> but it, was, it was overcoming that barrier of, of that terrible injury that happened like days after being put on the job. Um, Okay, uh, well, good warm up question for everyone. I'm going to switch to uh, to the supporting moms and also since we have a second generation here, uh, supporting someone growing up as a kid in the SCA. Um, so as someone who uh, grows up, uh, I mean, I, I joined the SCA as a teenager too, but uh, I don't consider myself to have been a kid in the SCA. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, our, our moms here. Uh, we, the question is, um, I'd like to talk about supporting moms and caregivers in fighting and how that balance poses challenges. For the mothers, what would you wish you had when you were new, a new mother and fencing or during your pregnancy in terms of community, support, uh, et cetera? 
Who wants to go? I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here, you want to go first? Go ahead. Sure. For me, I think I've actually had a pretty good experience overall, especially compared to some of the stories I hear from other people. Um, I had a lot of support from my community when I was pregnant. Um, some of them, I went to a tournament in the Rhetoric Hale, which was part of Aethelmark, and I was six months pregnant, and I you know, tied for first place in this tournament, and some of them didn't realize until after we were done the tournament. They didn't get to have an opinion <laughs> as to whether <laughs> I should fight or not. That was my choice. Their opinion didn't matter, uh, but it did apparently disturb some of them. <laughs> um, I, I kind of got lazy about fencing in the last months of pregnancy because in both cases it was fairly warm and I was being lazy. So I don't know out. if I'd call it lazy not fighting in your last months of pregnancy. But that, <laughs> that seems like, yeah. It's a good time to be lazy, how about that? Okay. <laughs> um, so my partner at the time and I did a pretty good job of splitting up the duties once the my biggest thing i really would have benefited from was having children that weren't quite so mummy attached because there were times i just couldn't put them down um, and that has much more to do with my kids than anybody around me and there's not a whole lot i could have done about it but as i got better um, i would go to our local practice on thursdays and my partner would go off to the um, practice in the next city on uh, tuesdays so we both got to go to practice. And when we did events, uh, we got together with a couple other families who also had children around the same age. And one of us would not fence, we would you know, focus on kid care and, and socializing for the day. And the other one would get to go and fence. Uh, it would have been better if we had more of an equal contribution to getting ready for the event. Things like you know, prepping food and packing things up. But there's, you know, has a whole lot more to do with the person I was partnered with at the time than anything else. Um, yeah, um, perhaps the most famous adventure we did was we actually went down to Gulf Wars with a five month old. Oh, wow. wow. What yeah. challenges did that pose? Well, A, <laughs> I do not recommend two day drive with a five year old, five month old, because she was really kind of pissed by the end of it. <laughs> and didn't stop screaming. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, after that, it, it was pretty much okay. You know, she was too small to crawl around. And we took down this, the battery-operated swing and for the time to set it up on the side of the field. And a little bit of the time, we would both go and fence because we could both see baby in the swing at the side of the field. And when she squawked, I would just say, hey, I got to go deal with this for a minute and go off and usually feed her because she liked being fed. <laughs> Avery has a lovely time um, recounting the story of me basically pausing and you know, saying, hey, I've just got to go off and going off and breastfeeding on the side of the field because that's what we were doing. Um, yeah, it's a memorable you, experience for him. Do your children play in the SCA? Yes, they're, for they're one and, and 17 now, right? Kind of for the other, yeah. Uh, my daughter has had a, a much better experience in the SCA because she's always had p kids around her age to socialize with in the SCA. And my son didn't get so lucky. We didn't have, he didn't really have kids around his age, and the ones that he did have were either a little bit older or a little bit younger. Yes, I'm, yes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Um, so she was, you know, interested. She's, uh, I was surprised actually when she first said that she wanted to start fencing and it was following a Penzik where she got to watch the other kids doing the youth fencing. And she said, mom, I want to do that. And I was kind of like, well, that's nice, but we don't have youth fencing. Mom, I still want to do that. <laughs> so we brought home a mask and set up an extra, we started a youth fencing program. Um, at that point, given the rather small size of Eldermere, we focused on just letting the you know, 12 to 14 year olds fence at practice with adults. And that was pretty much all it was, but yeah, she had fun. 
of our birthday, she was already the authorized. Do you want to contribute to this discussion, kid? Uh, this is the <laughs> Maestress of Defense panel, and they're talking the current question about being a mother. I'm not a mother, though. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, Lisa Beto, what about you? What challenges have you faced? What so? Oh, hey, kiddo. Uh, what what support would you have liked? What support has been helpful? Like, what's what's been? Yeah, stuff, mom. So um, one of my challenges, I unfortunately had a different experience when I was pregnant um, than Irony did. I had people who knew I was pregnant early because of the big Facebook announcement that I was expecting. So everybody in the kingdom knew that I was pregnant and I was KRM, so I was in a very public facing role. So I had people refusing to fight me. I had people telling me that, oh, I wouldn't feel comfortable because if something went wrong, it would be my fault. And totally talked to my doctor, it was totally cool, but because people were refusing, um, I stopped fighting a lot earlier than I would have liked to. So I think in terms of community support, understanding that doctors know what we're doing and the risks that we're taking and um, put out there that um, it is valid and acceptable for a woman to exercise while she's pregnant and hopefully get the community to understand that uh, would be helpful. Now, did you need any additional like support or armor or anything for that? Like, no. No. Okay. Um, the doctor didn't recommend that I had to wear anything special in terms of the armor because uh, what we had was already sufficient, and the baby was small and inside, so <laughs> right. plenty of natural padding there. Right. Um, and if you need it later. I have a, at this point, old document that I wrote up when it was more relevant for me if, with some research around just, you know, why it's not really a problem. <laughs> good, good. Um, and in terms of like um, balance, and it's very helpful to have a community around you. So um, my husband and I, like Irony, we have um, two practices in the area so we can split who goes to which one and um, take nights where he has the child or I have the child. And um, at five, she um, has friends to play with at practice. Um, and, um, but it does become challenging at events when we both want to play and it isn't always possible for us both to keep eyes on her. So sometimes it is having her at the side of the list and um, being able to pay attention to her and see her while I'm out there fighting. Um, and sometimes it's um, actually bringing in other resources, having my mom watch her, having babysitters. Um, so actually physically planning for, okay, I need support at this particular event for things like a tournament of defense where all of the mods are required to show up and present. Awesome. Um, yeah, we uh, we did have some some good mod discussion from moms at Penzik. I kind of touched on this last time as well, uh, but they were talking about how how SCA time hurts women because you plan with your partner that you are going to you know take over at this point in time. So if tournaments start late or tournaments start you know don't run over, that can mean that you can't stay in the tournament because you might have to leave to take care of your child. Or if you have hired a babysitter, you hire a babysitter for X amount of time. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's difficult when timing doesn't work out. Uh, I also had uh, an answer from one more mom that could not make it today. Uh, and so she gave me her feedback on this to, to add to the, uh, to the group. <laughs> so if you don't mind, uh, I'll read this real quick. Um, this is from uh, Maestra Natalia out of the East Kingdom. And so she wanted to give a bunch of suggestions uh, to people who are looking for ways to support moms. Uh, make sure that you start on time and end on time. Babies and kids do not allow for much variations and it makes that women will have to bow out of a tournament. Make sure there are snacks available at the list for the onlookers, kids and caregivers. Nothing makes a woman shine more than having her kids in the corner than kids in her corner who are not whining because they're hungry. Um, 
providing shade uh, helps uh, helps moms and, and having a place for their kids. <clears throat> um, having a place uh, for, for families in general. Uh, allow kids to, this was a really good suggestion, um, allowing kids to participate as list runners for your tournament so that they have something to do and, and, and uh, another adult non-fencing that is in charge of them so that the parent can fence. Um, it also may be offered to prioritize women in pairings because they may have to leave earlier if you're running late. Uh, ask them, but don't assume. Uh, it, another option to maybe be supportive would be to have extra water or refreshments available for parents because they probably remembered everything for their kid but totally forgot to take care of their own needs. Um, potentially offer earlier starts for women. Um, they could, you know, need warm up time that isn't filled with kid duties so they can clear their heads. Uh, be welcoming of people with families and say hi to the kids if they come because kids are people too and they, they need that interaction and they need that validation from us. Um, here is another good one and we touched on this one last episode. Make the guys be responsible for marshalling as much as the women. We had this happen at a Kings and Queens Rapier Championships where the marshal in charge did not think ahead so he is low on marshals. So he asked for people to step out of the tournament and marshal. I traveled from Rhode Island to Delaware to fight and I turned to Robert and said, do not let me step out of this tournament because I felt enormous guilt to do that. Another woman who was local and doesn't get out much started to drop out and I walked over her and said, they will be fine. You should not drop out of the tournament. Let some guys pick up the slack. She stayed in but wasn't going to until I said something. Eventually they had enough marshals, but the women were going to be the ones volunteering first. In short, make sure you have enough marshals, make sure that there are more men than women. If you look around, it usually is more women than men marshalling. And don't ask because people are arriving and gearing up. This is general, but doubly so for women with families. Their whole body is focused on service to the community, their family and their children, and it's hard to turn it off. Women and caregivers need advocates and allies who are going to stand up for them when they might get pushed around, either to get pushed around in the service track or not enough time uh, in the suit and on the field. Um, and also her last point was to, uh, if, you're, if you're the marshal in charge of an event, organize with the event coordinator so there could be a drop off activity or something. Uh, at the same time you're scheduling tournaments uh, so that uh, there can be kids activities with the kid coordinator at the same time there's rapier community activities. Um, so those were some things that she she offered in bullet point uh, via messenger. Um, I would like to support one of the points um, that she was saying that um, you don't need to drop out of the tournament because other people will be there. Um, a um, kind of policy that I put in place for myself is, is that I will actively volunteer myself for local events and when you are traveling to our events, um, don't be the first to volunteer that um, it's, you're putting on your local area, you can support your local group, but if you're traveling and being other places, there are other people that are there that are responsible and can be responsible. Philidor. So not a mom, but just like the numbers wise, right? There are more men on the field and there are more men being elevated because they're, they're working on their prowess. And asking moms to do marshalling, I just think is cruel and unusual punishment. So we, they do say do so much as is. So I ask all of the rapier moms out there to please don't marshal. <laughs> Make someone else do it. We, they will pick up the, the, the job that needs to be done. Is not some, you have enough to do. You really do. You have enough to do. I so feel like mom's time is so valuable on the field right. that we should let them fight. Exactly. Um, the kingdom, we try to have the marshals also be the fencers. In most tournaments, there's no reason why you can't just trade places with other people. There are some kingdoms that's not, not allowed. Yeah, that's an that's inter an unfortunate choice. Yeah. Um, did, did you guys have any follow-ups to that? Uh, or should I move on to the next? Uh, Becky had a follow-up question in the... Yeah, right. it was a follow-up question. Um, and so, oh, and Britta, Britta the Viking goddess of fence. Hi, Britta. Um, Britta says, learn to say no. Uh, so uh, we are we are socialized as women to say yes, learn to say no. 
Um, so uh, Mattia from uh, Antier, hello Mattia, says uh, she's going to ask a very sensitive question. She's found that a lot of moms aren't receptive uh, when offered to watch kids so they can participate. What can you do to help moms uh, be more acceptable or comfortable accepting help? Is this, how do you feel about that? I would say that part of it isn't necessarily that I don't want help. It's that my daughter is a mommy's girl. So at some points in time, I just recognize that she's not willing to go to somebody else. So um, part of it is being comfortable knowing that it's not about you, that um, it might be the family situation. And other ways to help the mom become more comfortable, um, maybe um, talk about experiences that you've had with kids if you have um, uh, siblings or if you have um, experience working in childcare or something like that, or just why you like spending time with kids. Um, it helps bring that camaraderie together so that a uh, mother would be more comfortable letting her child go with you. I'll support most of that. My daughter wouldn't have gone with anybody for most of her life as when she was you know, small enough to need to go be some with somebody. My son might have. Um, things to make it easier is you know, make it a slowly get to know the kids part uh, ahead of time or over a series of events. Offer to do something with them at the side of the field because then they can still see mom or dad and mom and dad can still see them. Everybody's probably going to feel more comfortable at that point. Awesome. Great. Um, it, unless there's any more feedback uh, people want to give, uh, I'm going to pivot over to you, uh, Maestro Rosa, uh, who grew up in the SCA as a kid. And what could we as a community have done to support a kid in the SCA to get to, to, to where you're at? There's obviously a lot of problems with retention of second generation. Um, and that you're a second generation that, that made it as far as you have uh, speaks to your engagement. Uh, but we, we don't tend to engage or retain uh, kids as often as we could. Uh, what, what would you have to, to give us your insight on that? Um, come to my second generation panel on Friday and learn more. <laughs> Um, I actually have a bunch of peers from different aspects that we're actually going to go over this exact situation um, from different perspectives, different um, kingdoms. So it's uh, so far I got East, Middle, me, um, Joel, Duke Morgan, that was just our last Kings that you've even agreed from Ontario. Um, so I've got Dukes, Pelicans, and Laurels all coming in on Friday. I made sure it was very diverse. Um, I also have one more second generation mod, but I'm unique in the fact that my dad's a mod and I'm a mod. Um, <laughs> to the family. Yeah, uh, my dad and I have been actually fighting for the same amount of time. Um, because I thought it was cool what my dad was doing and Germany didn't really care as much. So Drakenwald, we actually had Dutch Olympic fencers that were like, here, have gear, let's fight, um, that were really good friends of us. The hardest part was turning 18 and 21. Um, the biggest part of second generation is a lot of us, disappear because of college and financial reasons um a lot of us get the holy crap i can't believe you can drink already thing at, especially at penzik um it's true so there's a lot of other things that we also have to learn and it's it's hard because we've been in it so long and we've done so much um service and stuff that we feel like we're there but really we're just really older teenagers and not ready for anything that takes a lot to learn but um the hardest part that i've noticed i've been pretty lucky in both the mid -room and um on tier is getting out from your parents shadows um Elizabeth can attest to my dad's personality <laughs> and and bring it and anyone else that knows Maximilian um, that he's hard to kind of get out of so 
back to the other question of what was the hardest but the, for the vigil, it was actually easier to be my own person out here finally. So I've got to experience the SCA as not a second generation and still have the mid middle when I visit to have that second generation. Like I get a lot of congratulations and stuff. Um, but it's really hard, at least it, it took a while for four people like recognize what you did and stuff. But I think it also really out here, I got a whole new experience because no one knew who my parents were. No one knew I had siblings. My brother dropped out and more because he didn't care for the hobby. Uh, my sister's on and off and nowhere near the level of participation, usually because of work. Um, All right. But yeah, we'll have, we'll have more of these questions Friday about Friday. Um, uh, <laughs> second generation and what we want to do to retain us. Okay, uh, I have one comment I want to read from the um, from the chat, and if anyone wants to follow up that comment, uh, otherwise I will scoot to the next question. Um, the comment is, our family's experience has been pretty negative with regards to children's activities in the SCA, and the adults volunteering for that work aren't always super qualified to work with a wide variety of children. That could be regional, but it's a concern. Do you have any advice or feedback or thoughts about this? Um, and especially as it relates to someone who would rather have some time on the field and if, if that's preventing you from being on the field. It is um, because in our kingdom, you can't just drop your child off. I'm not sure what the rules are elsewhere, but we don't have drop off events. So um, one of the parents needs to be at, at the side of the children's activities and participating. So. Um, if there are children's activities, um, one or both of the parents are usually there and involved. So um, that does make it challenging. And uh, the qualifications of the uh, folks working with the children is also a concern that um, they might not be uh, qualified to handle different uh, types of um, children and um, make you more uncomfortable in terms of participating in those activities. Okay. Eldermere hasn't had a whole lot of organized kids activities over the years, especially when my kids were younger. Often there's a craft table, which you're just as likely to find the adults at as the children. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, pros and cons to that, but that I haven't had a problem with it. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you for letting this non-child uh, uh, moderator uh, uh, fumble through those questions. I'm, I hope it wasn't as awkward as I thought it might have been. Um, I'm going to pivot to the next question. Uh, Nicolina uh, brought a really good question. Um, last time we talked about women feeling overlooked for mentorship and being too afraid to ask, how can we teachers make mentorship more available without making people feel like we're mansplaining or giving unwanted advice. All right, Ilidor. Can I ask a clarifying question first though? Sure. You just said mentorship, which to me means more of a longer term relationship. And previously you said just advice. Are we looking at both or uh, either? I, I believe in this context, we're asking for um, advice, maybe from like a long-term marshal uh, of, of your group or something, um, not necessarily like a cadet Provost relationship. Right. Yeah. So, um, so how how can teachers make that that situation? Because sometimes, you know, we get oversensitive about unsolicited advice, and so, you know, how do we balance that? Um, the original uh, comment was: we regularly have angry threads from people about unsolicited advice, in which people are charged under no circumstances under no uncertain terms to never give any advice or mentorship unless specifically requested. How do we balance this? I know a lot of fencers who are spooked about openly giving advice, especially to women, because they don't want to uh, sound like they are, are mansplaining or being overbearing, um, but also some women feel like they're overlooked and not given advice or assistance because people are uh, gun shy about giving them advice. So how do we, how do we find that balance? So I have two things. The first one was uh, Don Julian, who's currently living in Atlantia, did a really good class on this. And he um, 
talked about advice in like the tea analogy, right? Where you like, you don't give someone tea um, if they are unconscious or you don't give someone tea if they don't want tea, right? If they say, no, you don't want tea. So his, his he gave a whole large number of, uh, of uh, in, in his talk. But one of the ones that really stuck with me was when you were going out to fence, right? And you're obviously a mod or white scarf and the person is not asking them, what do you want out of this? Like that's on us as the leaders, right? For us to ask them, hey, what do you want out of this? Do you want to, you know, is this, how, do you want me? Because I need, if you want me to give you good advice, right? I have to be paying attention to something other than just how to murder you, right? In front of me, like it's how do I, how do I win? That's primarily the four part of my mind. And if you want good advice from me, I need to be, I need to prep my brain. Okay, I need to do two things at the same time. Um, otherwise you'll just get general advice that I give everyone. Um, so that's one, one thing to do is to, um, is to prep the person ahead of time to either, either ask ahead of time, Hey, I'm going to fight you. I would like to fight you. Can you give me advice afterwards? And, and they will, and be receptive to it. And the second one I suggest is, and this has worked for me is I have had um, people come up to me and go, Hey, this is my friend. This is a person I know. They would like some advice. They would like some help. So you need like a wingman, right? We just need like advice wingmen, right? To be like the facilitator to give it help to give the advice. Like someone will be upset that they're not getting advice. That person needs a wingman to go to the mod and be like, hey, do you have time to give advice? So that way they like that kind of separates some of the anxiety from the person who's not who, who wants the advice there, the how to ask it. I think this is something that we can get over. It just requires a community effort to work on it. Nicolina. This was uh, it was kind of my question. Um, <laughs> not to call you out. I just called you out. I'm sorry. Uh, one thing that was uh, that this reminded me of is uh, Don Andro. He told me once that or he, he's from the Outlands. Um, he told me once that he likes to when he's going out to fight someone say, "Do you want a lesson, a spar, or a fight?" And he defines the lesson as predominantly instruction. The spar is kind of halfway in the middle, I guess, and then the fight is, "All right, dial it up. Let's go." <laughs> okay, Ace. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, as, as far as uh, how, how I've answered this in the past, um, I'll fight someone and I'll say, hey, you know, I, I think I saw something I'd like to, to talk about if you're interested. And some people are like, no, I just want to fight. I'm like, cool. You know, <laughs> or if they or if they're really interested, that's that's also, uh, you know, fine, too. I'm happy to give it. Um, one of the things I often ask people is what how did you win or how did you lose and why do you think that? Um, and see how they how they answer that is uh you know then you can go from there uh anyone else i would just reiterate what elador was saying you know it, right. say right off the bat or ask right off the bat whether you want to get advice or don't want advice okay um so i'm gonna i'm gonna shift gears a little bit actually and say uh i got kind of a two-part question. Do you think we romanticize, uh, let me see which one of these is first. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think we romanticize uh, the idea of the quick natural learner to the systemic detriment of women? If so, what makes you think so? And how do you counter it? If not, what makes you think so? And do you think that there is another pattern in how we perceive prowess that is problematic? There's, there's a big question. Who wants it? Um, you know, yeah, I, I think I think that we do romanticize the idea of, oh, they're just quick or oh, they're they're naturally good. Um, and, and that comes down to a bit of a, a bit of natural athleticism that could be systematically detrimental to women. Um, and uh, but does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Nicolina. Yeah, uh, I do agree. I think that we do romanticize that. 
And it is very much to the detriment of not just women, I think our community in general, because um, in my experience, the people who are quick learners had, quick learners actually had some relative background, like um, the ones I'm thinking of came from some other martial art. And so they have the, it, the confidence in a fighting situation is a learned trait. And so they're already confident going out there and being assertive and things like that. Um, whereas somebody might be have just as much natural aptitude, but they just don't quite have the background yet. Um, and also somebody who doesn't, it doesn't come to quite as naturally, very often turns out to be the best teacher in the long run because they, rather than just gliding through and it making sense to them off the bat, they have to figure it out. They have to find out ways of overcoming those obstacles. And just like some of the best math teachers I know really struggled with math when they were a kid, it, it works the same way with fencing. Okay, uh, anyone else? Do you think that uh, the SCA romanticizes the idea of the quick natural learner to the systemic detriment of women? Yes, a... yes, I do, um, because I've had both perspectives and students and both female. One seemed to pick it up naturally, she was deadly, and the other one struggles with it because she's just not, she's athletic-ish, but she just doesn't, it seems like it's the mental game too of you're trying to have um you're trying to be at that you're you're good at something else like she's excellent at archery but trying to get the mindset in the tournament set is oh that person's just taller than me and and stuff and also there's a lot of things that which i teach in a class also that just sets back people and I say it across both genders, but definitely mostly women that they just don't think they're fast enough or they're too short or how can they have a natural fight or something that I work on with my personal student right now all the time that the confidence and just the having that romanticized vision is really hard on her. You're never too short. Elidor. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I think it romanticized, it's romanticized and it is a detriment to women um, because of perception, right? It's the perception that men are going to do better than women in this sport. And, that, and perception often becomes reality because of just the way, because it gets reinforced over and over again. However, one of the things that I think of is sort of like having a natural ability to do a thing means that you're not having to work and learn new ways to to do the thing right like you've, I've done it always this way and so um, people who have had to learn because they did not have the natural ability um, t tend to be able to break down their fight and they're able to break down what the other people are doing and they're able to learn and process new new abilities because they've had they they had to learn that this is, it takes a while to learn a thing someone who is who is naturally good at it, it when you're they're faced with an obstacle and they can't automatically learn how to do a new lunge or a new thrust or a new cut or whatever uh have a harder time than someone who's already learned okay it's going to take me four weeks to learn how to do this cut because that's how at least as much time as it took me the last time i had to learn something new they learn that this process takes time and you have to drill and you have to do all the hard work to get it and so um duke malcolm called the when i back long long ago he called these like the blue collar fighters right they had they had they didn't have any um they didn't have any uh they they didn't have a natural ability but they were hard working and they knew that they if they put in the work they would get to where they needed to go that's a really good description of it very bruce springsteen yeah. <laughs> uh anyone else I, I haven't seen romanticized. Uh, oh, we, we have a few romanticized questions. They were. <laughs> oh, okay. That, to me, that was an odd word. 
Um, and I've seen both quick and natural learners. Um, I've seen a, a very small number of people who seem to pick up sword fighting and they just, it just flows right out of them. Uh, that's, that's, they're kind of rare and kind of amazing. I've seen quick learners tend to be the ones who've already got uh, experience with moving their body around, usually from some sort of sport. It doesn't even have to be a martial art, just something that's kept them using their body and knowing what they can do with it. And some of them are so quick at it that they stop listening and they start doing this one thing and they get carried away with the thing they're doing and they think it's great and they fail to realize all the ways in which they're not doing it really very well. And they often plateau at a point uh, much sooner than somebody who's taking a more slow and steady perspective and understanding what they're trying to do and listening to the drills. All right. Uh, anyone else or a new question? All right. I'm going to move on to a new question then. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. Uh, how, how did you get the confidence that you needed on the field to succeed? Who's, who's up for it? I started, uh, I started fencing at 13 from a summer camp doing modern fencing. And I had teachers and we went from the summer camp into a local modern fencing club and we had teachers with a modern fencing background who focused on doing drills and teaching you carefully how to do things and making you repeat them over and over and over again. <laughs> and you know, we went to tournaments as often a bunch of kids going in and fighting with the adults. So there wasn't any real, real reason to expect that you had to be the best. You just got to be you and do what you could do. And yeah, I, I guess between those things and, and the you know, natural level of confidence, there was no reason not to think I could do it just as well as anybody else. Uh, Illidor. So I got very lucky and I had parents who had very high expectations of me, not only in school, but in sports. My dad taught me at age eight how to throw an elbow in, in basketball eight years old. This is how you throw it. You go low. If you go high, you'll get a bloody nose and then you get a technical and get thrown out. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like there was always a high expectation of like, you're, you're going to, you have to drill for you to get good. You have to go and do three point basketball shots. If you want to make that in a game, you have to do all. And I learned this at a very young age. I, at, at a young age, in, in all honesty, like uh, I think my parents, particularly my dad, treated me much more like boys are treated. Like there was an expectation that I was going to do well. And so I rose to meet that expectation. I was a sports girl, my, basically from age eight through age 18. I was doing three or four different kind of sports every year. I mean, every season you know, per year. Anyways, because of this, when I picked up, I took... I took my 20s off, did video games and whatnot, but when I hit 31 and decided I was going to start fencing, I had already had that background of understanding that, hey, if you do this work and do the drills and everything, you will get where you want to go. But I also knew it was going to take a lot of work and a lot of time. Like I didn't get to be clean up softball in, in a week, right? It took years of effort and then eventually they were putting me on on the team because they knew I was going to hit that sucker really far and that's and that's kind of like what I I think we don't we fail women now in doing is not telling them hey this is going to take a long time and but you can do it and 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 this is the way right you get good by doing drills and getting your form good and um and then the rest of it will, will come over time it's just going to take up it's going to take time for you to build up your skills that you need to be built up nicolina so for me like 
everything that's been mentioned, I love it, is, and it's super important. Just uh, adding on to that, something that was important for me was having role models. Like after I moved to Artemisia, um, I'm the first female mod here, and so there were not a whole lot of super active women fencing at the time. And um, I, like, I remember driving home from practice one day and going, you know, is this something I can be good at? It was more height related than being a woman because everybody that was tearing up the field was six foot plus. And then I, I I'm five seven, so I'm not short by, especially by female standards, but I'm definitely not as tall as them. Um, Master Elias here, he's exactly the same height as I am. And he's been Kingdom Rapier champion like nine or 10 times. I'm like, oh, you know, he's, he, he's definitely not female, but I'm still, he was still my role model of like, you know what, if he can go out there and kick ass, so can I. All right, good answer. Uh, anyone else? Was it better? So I talked a little bit about it, but um, some of the other things I did was putting in the work. So um, actually going to other practices, traveling around the kingdom, testing myself against people who had started about the same time as I am, and um, seeing if how I felt our matchups were. So um, pick out people in the kingdom that you like and can give you good feedback, and that helps me build my confidence. Uh, so I'm going to go next. Uh, I, I, the, the story about how I got started in fencing is kind of hilarious. Um, when when I was a, when I was a little girl, I always wanted to do a martial art, um, and my mom always told me, "No, girls don't do that." Um, and then there were things I wanted to try sports wise. My mom's like, "No, girls don't do that." Um, and so, you know, she was, she was born in the forties. And so that's just her mentality that she came at me with. And so, you know, that stuck with me as an adult. And so when I became an adult and, and I went away to college and I, um, you know, I'd, I'd already found the FCA while I was in high school, but I wasn't a fighter yet. And so I go there and I go to a fencing practice just because that's where everyone hangs out in the Barony of Phoenix. Like the art people hang out up, up top in this like little upper area with tables and then the fighters go in the gymnasium part of the, the thing and it's actually a whole Barony social. And so I'd show up and the rapier marshal there was like, you should fence. And I was like, no, that sounds terrible. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to get hit. I don't want to hit other people. Like, why would I want to do that? That seems awful and scary. And um, I, I, I was, I'm an artist and I went to school for, for art. And so quite oftentimes, you know, why, why buy food when I could buy paint? Um, it's actually kind of, uh, I'm, I'm famously known for, if you feed me, I will keep coming back around. Um, even now that I make money, it's just an artist habit, I do that. And so uh, at some point in time, uh, said Rapier Marshall, uh, Uterich, uh, had, uh, had was hosting a grill out. And I was like, oh, a grill out. That sounds like food. I'll show up. And so I show up to this grill out and it turned out to be also a fencing practice. And I was like, I feel tricked. I definitely <laughs> feel tricked. Like, <laughs> and so I was like, I was like, well, why don't you just try it? And so I put on a mask and I held my sword and I was very small and nervous. And and he would he would have me hit him with a sword and I would go Boop. like you know like I was afraid to touch someone because I was afraid I don't know how hard you have to hit someone to hurt them like right and I don't want to be hit and so then he would come at me with a sword and I go and and it took a long time to get the blinking the flinching uh out of me because I flinched and I blinked and I was nervous um, and, and I was not confident at all. And my first, my first tournament uh, ever was, uh, my barony was hosting a local event and uh, I entered it and I went out and I just fought everything. And, and I'd never entered a tournament in my life before. Uh, and so I didn't really know the format or whatever. I just went out and fought people. And they're like, at the end, the marshal goes over to the list table and says, who won? And they're like, well, Brigitte, she has no losses. And I was like, what, Brigitte, I won? 
Um, and I won a dagger. And so then I took that dagger to my, my practice and I worked with it and I kind of was, I still flinched. I still panicked. I still would, would stop breathing and hold my breath. Um, and, uh, and then I, and it took a long time to figure out how to breathe while fighting because I was always in a panic that I was being hit by someone or that I had to hit someone. Um, heaven forbid a sword came at my face. It was, um, and so, uh, and then I had to go get my dagger authorization and to this day, I would have failed me but they were determined that I was gonna get authorized that day. So after 45 minutes of trying to get me to hit them with a dagger to see what my calibration would look like, they finally pushed me enough that I stabbed them with a dagger. Now, of course, today, if, you know, I, the rapier and dagger is my game, like I've been fighting this for almost, you know, 20 years now. And so I have no confidence problems, uh, but it was very hard for me to learn how to get over that hump, to learn how to breathe to learn how to not flinch. And for the life of me, I can't tell you how I stopped flinching um, or how I stopped doing those things. But one day I just realized, well, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> and, and so uh, in, in a way, uh, I overcame some serious confidence hurdles myself uh, when I first started because I had no background in sports or, um, or, uh, or martial arts. And that's not true. I did sports. I did two sports in high school, I did basketball, you're gonna laugh, I did basketball and track, and I'm five foot. Now, I was, I was not ever put out in a game, and in track, they put me in the middle of a relay, because they're like, well, she wants to, and it's high school, so we'll let anyone follow their dreams, but little kiddo, like, no. <laughs> and so I only fought, I only played in those sports because I was told I couldn't do it. And I don't like being told I can't do something. Um, but, uh, but by gosh, I was terrible at it. So <laughs> that did not help my confidence going into fencing. Uh, so that's my story. Anyone else? I'm going to kind of go off of the comments that I see over here in my experience. Obviously, I just started coming out and being a female in December. So I grew up mostly male, but my parents were actually very gender neutral about things my brother did ballet my sister did ballet i did karate just because we wanted to if we asked my parents we wanted to do something we did um now the whole coaching thing i do i feel like my dad was a coach for all our teams at least once and since i started at 10 I don't know. I had the hardest time not being tickled with a sword growing up. It was really weird. Uh, that was the hardest thing for me to come over. It took about four years, but I also take a lot of things for granted that I've been fighting for 25 and um, what I take as for natural is just the fact that I've done it for going on 30 years. Um, but yes, I would agree with the comment that playing sports usually you do get the coaching and the practices and the stuff and i think a lot of people mistake that for getting your skill and your confidence level to there i've actually done a way more practicing out here than i ever did in the middle because i injured myself and i had to learn to refocus on how to move differently so my confidence has gone up and down and up and down over the times because it was, I used to have speed. I used to not have speed. Um, it, it's a journey for everybody. Um, but I think the hardest part is getting the coaches to help you because not a lot of us are experienced teachers. Um, so that's also a hard thing for us when we started what in the nineties for me, it was everybody was learning what to do at the same time. So that, yeah, that's my journey. The, the comment that Rosa responded to that I think is a really good comment and it warrants repeating on screen is, I think there are a lot of skills that people who play sports growing up learn through having access to practices and coaches that are really useful in fencing, but are not taught in the SCA and are rarely discussed. Um, and uh, Nicolina. 
Um, I would also add that I think a lot of skills are taught to men that uh, are very useful in being successful in the SCA that are not so much taught to women. That is a truth bomb right there. Uh, yes. Um, so I'm going to take uh, one last question in the Zoom. This is going to be our, our last question of the night, uh, but do keep the questions coming. I am keeping a log of them uh, so that we can uh, field questions uh, later. Uh, and this, this last question uh, is, how do you deal with surpassing your teachers in skill? Ooh, ooh. All right, Rosa. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was kind of different. Um, already surpassed or Brigham and I have known each other for a long time. Um, we were teenagers at the same time. Yes. So we were bratty to each other for the longest time too. That's true. I think it's just that you learn to teach each other. And if you have that type of relationship that there's a lot of things that if you're surpassing either the teacher is really great or you're traveling more or something, but I looked for other outlets. Like even when I was even with my dad before I got a scarf, I looked for other outlets to try to keep my skill going. Cause sometimes you do plateau even with the same teacher. Um, and then you talk to your teacher about like, I feel, how do I feel like we're at even level? How do I get better? Um, or if you are getting better, who else to talk to? Sometimes you're already possibly at that point of being a peer, depending on your PLQs. So you'll soon become the teacher. But I think it's a lot of how, what type of relationship do you have with your teachers that, to me, that would matter more over what skill you have. All right. From my SCA fencing experience, uh, I've rarely had a teacher local to me that I could work with on a regular basis to teach me something new. I've always been at the, the forefront and teaching everybody else. So it's often been a matter of uh, finding somebody who's also interested in you know, taking it slower and doing some drills and thinking up the things that you want to learn and turning them into a drill. Like I wanna practice doing this one thing um, you know, I, I was off at Penzik and somebody pointed out that I do this thing too often. Uh, I want to practice doing something else. You just got to take control of your own teaching. And on the other hand, when I realized that I really wanted to be a learner more often, I picked up another sport outside of the SCA. Uh, I'm going to pause real quick. Emily, did you want to say the thing on confidence? I'm sorry. I feel like I just I, I missed over you. No, I, I mean, I, everything everyone said was just great. There was just one, one little thing that was taught to me is to do things out of your comfort zone. Um, because once you're successful at doing things out of your comfort zone, that confidence just keeps building. Awesome. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, continuing on with how do you deal with surpassing your teachers in skill? Illidor. So, um, uh, what I think your best bet is to have a really good teacher that's not, that is going to be proud of you when you get better than they are, right? So, that is in fact what happened to me. I had uh, I had basically a collective of teachers, right? In the St. Swithin's Bog, I would have to say that they were my primary teachers, and Master Quinn was probably my 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 biggest um, my biggest teacher when I was there. Great guy. Um, I see Emily's like, is he is he watching right now? That's great. Um, and he um, he has was always like, this is this is how you get better. This is, you know, or he never, he never would, would, um, he never, he and the rest of the bargers would never, um, they would always be excited when, when you got better than them, because then this was, we had to get better. Exactly. Right. Cause there, it's like still a, it's always, it, we are, we all love each other, but it is still a competition, right? Like, I'm, oh I'm, yeah. I'm, and Yago, Yago's my nemesis, and I'm gonna get him somehow, some way. I'm gonna get him. 
And now I have cadets and former cadets, and some of them have gotten better than me, and that annoys me to no end, <laughs> but I also love them, and I'm super proud of them. I am so proud of every single aspect that they do, and when they get better, it just makes me super happy for them. It also brings out the competitive bitch in me, and I want to get better so that they can't get me with that lefty shit that they always pull. Just saying, I'm going to figure it out and they won't be able to do it anymore. Just saying, just saying, right? That, then you'll get better. That's right. It's a, it, 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 I feel like if you have a good relationship, mentor, mentee, student, teacher, cadet, don, master, provost, you should have a good relationship where you're both learning from each other at all, at all times. Grimari's <laughs> like very specific there, Illidor, why I may have some people in mind. <laughs> I would agree with that, that it's a friendly competition, that it's not necessarily that you're surpassing them for all time because next time it might be your teacher bests you again. So you continue pushing the bar and learning from each other. Nicolina? Uh, I was actually reading the comments and kind of lost oh. the thread. Oh, okay. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you deal with surpassing your teachers in skill? That was a question from the comments we got. Um, so I have only, like, I don't even think I've surpassed my teacher. It's more coming on to the same level. And really, my, my teacher, Master Bacon, is really awesome about it. He's just, in fact, he's ecstatic and so like somebody mentioned um it, it there is some friendly rivalry but it's completely friendly anyone else uh when uh when i started fencing uh my my teacher uh, i was cadet to uh Ulrich, and uh he was kind of that coach that was a dad to me like i was kind of a bratty teenager and he's a retired marine so he would wake me up at 4 a.m. to drive to an event so that we could help set up the list group, so we could help the marshal, so we could help our barony set up the list. So we did it. And I was like, why do we have to get up so early all the time? And, and he would make me uh, help set up the list, help tear down the list, be the last fighter on the field. But what, and it was, it was a great, it was, it was what I needed. It was the motivation I needed. It was the support I needed to grow up. Uh, that as a, a very isolated only child, I didn't have that growing up uh, to, to, to be had. Um, and so, uh, so that, that was kind of what I needed at that stage in my life. But what I didn't get as much out of as I needed was, here is how to fence. Um, and he was really good at saying, okay, here's eight guards, poke that wall. Okay, we're going to do footwork drills. Okay, now we're just going to bite and spar. Okay. I was like, okay, what do I, what do I need to work on? You know, and I, I didn't get a lot of really good uh, teaching. Uh, learning and teaching is a different skill than fighting. And some people are good fighters, but not great teachers. And some people are great at teaching some lessons in life and not others. And so uh, I would actually have to go around and find people who, who could teach me. I would, I would find, you know, people who would go here or there or everywhere. Um, and, and do that teaching. And that, that sort of drive, that quest for knowledge is actually what caused me to put in a bid for the Known World Academy of the Rapier uh, twice. And eventually I did uh, run the Known World Academy of the Rapier in 2008 because uh, we needed those people to come in and teach and teach us here in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati area. Um, there weren't a lot of teachers in that area. And when I got made a bronze ring, he and I were the only teachers. And so eventually, I feel like my skill did definitely surpass my original teacher. Uh, but that doesn't change my, my emotions about my past relationship with him. It just means maybe I can fight better. <laughs> so, um, well, uh, are there any closing comments anyone wants to make? Did I miss uh, something someone wants to jump back on? Uh, just a quick reminder, any more second generation questions you might have will be on Friday, same time, 5.30. Uh, I'll be hosting, I'll post it around. Um, 
but yeah, we'll have a big discussion. There's about 10 of us that will be talking there. Okay, uh, don't worry, this is being recorded. It will be posted. Um, and uh, I just wanted to remind everyone, do please submit your questions. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll keep having these panels as long as people still show up. And next time I will try to not conflict with uh, Master Wistrick's uh, big uh, online class at the same time, because uh, I was unaware that I was conflicting <laughs> until recently. Um, so, okay, friends, that was episode two of the Maesters of Defense uh, discussion panel. We'll keep doing this as long as we have sufficient questions and topics. I think I have enough questions for at least one more episode uh, so far, so send them along. Uh, your mod to, to your moderator team, me, Lador, whatever. Uh, so, so keep the questions coming. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Maestros, for joining us and answering questions. Uh, and thank you for those participating uh, and listening. And uh, we appreciate everything. Uh, so uh, have a great night. And uh, until next time, bye. Bye. Bye.